you have your copy of God's Word, I'd ask you to open up with me to Philippians chapter 2. And this morning, I'm glad to be joined by my oldest brother and his family. Over here, they're visiting from Hattiesburg, Mississippi. And yesterday, they arrived about noon and drove that 832-mile trip. I think they're uh, a little still tired of sitting, so I'm sorry about that. But uh, as with every one of my family members that's come, and I've had a few come through, and my sister actually will be coming through also on Wednesday, I'm quick to introduce them to my new place of employment and to my new church family. <laughs> Yesterday, after a quick bite to eat, uh, my brother's family and, and my family walked through the buildings, and I explained to them the different areas and what was going on there. As I went on the tour with them, we went into the gym, and I realized I'd been to many games and many things in the gym, but I'd never been in the weight room. So I actually opened the, you know, I have a key for everything, it seems like. So I was able to open up the door to the weight room and go in and see uh, the amazing equipment that's, that's there supplied in the weight room. Well, as I was preparing this sermon, I began to think about the touring the buildings, And I wish that we all could pick up our belongings right now. We're not going to do it. But I wish we could all pick up our belongings and go on a tour right now to tour the campus. I don't think it's feasible, but I would like to do so. And I'd like to show you one of my favorite rooms on campus. Well, we're not able to go and do that, but I did snap a picture of it this morning. And this is one of my favorite rooms. And let me just explain to you why. It's not because of the decor, even though I like the deer on the wall. It brings me back to my Alabama. It makes me feel really at home. And it's not for the comfort that we have there in the room. But every Tuesday and every Friday, Pastor Andrew, Pastor Lucas, Mr. Chipman, Alex Pinto Vendal, and myself, we meet in this room to discuss the important matters in the life of the church. In each meeting, there's a priority, and that focus is on you. Now, I don't mean you collectively. I mean you individually. We discuss the challenges that some of you are facing and the victories that some of you are enjoying. And while we also spend time discussing matters of the church, we spend focused time praying for you, for known issues in which you are going through. This is why this is an important room and one of my favorite rooms in this building. In this room, I hear your pastors clear concern about you as individuals and our church family. I hear them and join them in crying out to God on your behalf, praising God for the victories and pleading with God to be gracious to you in your challenges. I wish you could be there to hear how much these men love you And how much I have grown to love you as well. As you take your copy of God's word and open up to the book of Philippians, I want to remind you that Paul is writing from a prison in Rome to a church in Philippi that he planted and that he loves. Throughout chapter 1, if you were to peruse through chapter 1, Paul's love for the Philippian church was evident. In verse 3, he says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. Verse 4, he says, always offering prayer with joy for you. Verse 7 says, I have you in my heart. Verse 8, he says, I long for you. In verse 24, he says, to remain in the flesh is more necessary. Why? On your account. You see his love, his concern, his care. In verse 26, he says, I I want to come to be with you again. Paul wanted to visit them again. And as we think through where we've actually been in the book of Philippians, and we think about the joy from jail, 
Let's review a few things. First, what we saw is that Paul calls the Philippian believers to live as citizens of heaven in Philippi. I included in the outline Philippians 1, 27, in which he says, Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel, so that whether I come to you and see you or am absent, I may hear that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. As citizens of heaven, living a manner worthy. That word is the word polis, which means live as a citizen in a way that's in line with the gospel of Christ. Living a life that's consistent with God's word. Secondly, we also saw that Paul calls the Philippian believers to live in true harmony for the sake of the gospel. When persecution comes to the Philippian church, his desire is for them to not live in fear, but to stand firm, to hold their ground, and to do so in one spirit, one mind, and strive together. Thirdly, we saw that Paul reminds the Philippian believers to, be f- to not be fearful sorry, of threats, but to trust God. We've talked about different threats to unity. Those threats that come inside the church through Lone Ranger, independent, individualistic mentalities, and through strife, which bring poison to the church. But we also talked about external threats like opposition, persecution, suffering, which we know are realities for godly churches. But Paul, he points out that God has given Philippian believers two gifts. The gift of faith and the gift of suffering. Faith is to rest in God's grace. Suffering is to mature and endure in order to bring glory to God. As we come to chapter 2, we see a pastor who loves his family. And he writes to instruct them on how they can make his joy complete. Let's look at what Paul has to say in Philippians chapter 2. Verse 1, so if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection or sympathy, complete my joy. And that's the centerpiece of this entire passage, complete my joy. And he tells them how to do so by being of the same mind, having the same love being in full accord and of one mind. He continues in verse 3 by saying, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you not look to his own interest, but to the interests of others. The centerpiece of this passage is that Paul In his pastoral tone, in his love for the church at Philippi, he says to them, complete my love, uh, my joy, sorry. Complete my joy. If you want to write out to the side a little bit to kind of give you an idea, when he says complete, what he means is he means fill full. Have a picture of a cup that has water in it, and he pours more water in it so that it's overflowing, causing it to abound. Now, it's interesting, in Philippians 2, verses 1 through 4, Paul follows his, his normal pattern as he writes texts, and really in a more focused way here in Philippians 2, 1 through 4. Paul writes giving theological truth, and then in the latter part of this ver- these verses, he gives practical application for this theological truth. And ultimately, what Paul is saying is Paul's joy is complete when he hears of the gospel 
being lived out in unity, humility, and compassion. So the first point that Paul is making here is that Christians, we as Christians, we must remember the foundation of joy. Paul wants the Philippian believers not to look to themselves for the foundation of joy, but really he wants them to look to the gospel as the foundation of his joy. That their joy is not rooted in their accomplishments or their circumstances, but it's really rooted in the graciousness of God. So as you look at this passage in verse 1, what you find is that Paul tells us four gospel gifts that he gives to the believer in salvation. He follows a pattern, and it actually states if, or another way to say it, that's a first-class conditional word, if. Really what he's saying is since. So since... There is encouragement in Christ. Since there's comfort in love, since there's participation in the Spirit, since there's affection and sympathy, now complete my joy. Does that make sense? But let's think about each one of these. First, he, the first gift that he mentions is this encouragement. And the encouragement really is because of a position in Christ. If you wanted to say it another way, what you could say is consolation or refreshment. That which gives us refreshment. Paul, pointing out this fact that we have encouragement in Christ. He also states this in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13, in which he says, But now, notice, in Christ... You who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. If there's any encouragement that we have, it's that God has given us a new position, and that position is in Christ. To put it another way, Paul states this in Colossians chapter 1, verses 13 through 14. He says, He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So we have a great encouragement that's been given to us. But not only that, we also have comfort from the demonstration of Christ's love. To put it another way, we could talk about it as in regard to reassurance that he's given us reassurance or a tender persuasion. This love that's being referred to here in chapter 2, verse 1, but also later on in verse 2, is the word agape. It's an agape love. Romans 5, 8 tells us that God shows his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So this great gift, this gospel gift that Paul is reiterating to us that we need to remember is that, hey, it's because of our understanding of the demonstration of Christ's love that we have comfort. And then thirdly, he states another gift. There's the participation because of the union in the Spirit. The participation, to put it another way, is the fellowship or joint participation that we have because of our relationship with Christ and joined with the Spirit. It's a close, mutual relationship. It's an, it's an involvement in the ministry. The picture I would have you to take is this. It's the picture of the body of Christ. When you trust Christ, Christ is the head, and you become a member of the body, carrying out what God desires for you to do. It's a connection to Christ. It's a connection with others who are also members of the body and making much of Christ. Romans 5, 
uh, sorry, Romans 8, 15 through 16 states this. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. And the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Paul states that there's one more gospel gift here, and that is the gift of affection and sympathy to care like Christ. To put it another way, it's the idea or the picture of the word is compassion. Compassion for others like God had compassion for you. And it's this picture of what you see when you're watching TV. I remember when I was younger watching TV and seeing Suzanne Summers come on TV with Feed the Children and the pictures of the children. And within me, that just wrenching of my, my stomach, my, my insides of just, wow, the need that's there. Well, that's the picture that we have here of compassion. Like we would say, my heart hurts for this person or that person. Matthew chapter 14, verse 14 states this. Referring to Jesus, it says, When he went ashore, he saw a crowd. And notice he didn't just see the crowd and think, Oh, I'm going to avoid the crowd. No, he saw the crowd and he had compassion on them. He was stirred to want to help the crowd. Why? Because he saw their sickness and he healed their sickness. So as we think about these four gospel gifts and as we think about remembering the foundation of our joy, I want you to also remember that Paul is writing here from jail. And in jail, Paul has joy because these gospel gifts are a present reality to him, even in the midst of his circumstance and situation. Your circumstances, I also not be the greatest. I understand that in a room like this and knowing the discussions that we've had on these Tuesdays and Fridays, we're struggling with medical issues. We're struggling with finances. We're struggling with this and that. I'm saying we, we as a church family, you as individuals are struggling with these things. You may be hurting, but let me just remind you that if you've trusted in Christ, these same gospel gifts can be present realities to you as well in the midst of your circumstance and your difficulty. Many of you have already turned the page, so you can turn the page now. And as we come to the, to the second point that Paul's making here, not only does he call us to remember these gospel gifts or this foundation of joy, a Christian who is aware that these four gifts are evident and, are able, and, and empower him and strengthen him and encourage him in life, him or her, a Christian will exhibit virtues of the gospel that are displayed in a gospel-centered life that we now see through verses 2 and through 4. Notice what Paul says. In verse 2, he says, Complete my joy. Now that you have the theological truth, or now that I've reminded you of present realities that you have available to you, complete my joy. And he tells us these virtues in a list-type fashion, doesn't he? So Christians, as we understand these virtues, Christians will display these virtues of a gospel-centered life. The first virtue, what you see in verse 2, is a life defined by a desire for unity. To put it another way, Right on the page there, like-minded, same thing think, is literally what's stated there. It's continually thinking the same as others. 
So as we think about that, I want to remind you the importance of unity. And I want to remind you of the importance of unity from a, another pastor. This pastor is John Calvin. And Calvin wrote a letter to a trusted a colleague, and he said this, Among Christians, there ought to be so great a dislike of schism as they may always avoid it as fast as lies in their power. John Calvin was pleading for his church and, and writing to this, this colleague to say, man, Christians need to fight for unity. It needs to be a strong desire, not just a, fast, a, a passing thing. It needs to be something that needs to be before us each and every day, a desire for unity. Well, as we look at this passage, what we find is Paul tells him to complete his joy by having this like-mindedness and having the same love. You know that unity, right, is grounded in the same love, by having the same love. And this love, as I told you earlier, is this love that's agape love. It's a selfless love. It's committed to the well-being of others. A perfect picture of this really is 1 Corinthians chapter 13. So think about 1 Corinthians 13, which in the passage it tells us love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It's not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It's not irritable, irritable sorry, or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. So the picture of this Love that we should be grounded in is there laid out for us in 1 Corinthians 13. It's an understanding of this love that God has given to us. That God has loved us in sending Jesus to die for us. And that we too should love one another. You know, a gospel-centered life can even love people they don't like. So think about that for a moment. Think about that. Unity is grounded in the same love, but continuing on, notice unity is tuned to the same spirit. Paul continues and he says, being in full accord. As I told you, in love to think about 1 Corinthians 13, in unity of the same spirit, I want you to think about this piano over here. Think about pianos that are tuned to the same tuning fork. Now, it doesn't matter if you come to this room and play on this piano, or if you go into the ministry center and play on that piano. They're tuned to the same fork. So, it'll sound the same way here as it sounds in the ministry center. A.W. Tozer pointed this out. He said this, Has it ever occurred to you that 100 pianos all tuned to the same fork are automatically tuned to one another? They are of one accord by being tuned, not to each other, but tuned to the standard to which each one must individually bow. So one Hundred worshipers, or in this room, take your best guess of the number that's in this room, all of us can be tuned to the same accord, same tuning fork, and that is each one of us looking to Christ, are in heart nearer to each other than we could ever possibly be when we're tuned we become united in conscious, consciousness as we turn our eyes away from the world and to the Lord. 
As we continue, notice what else he states here in regard to our focus. He says, Unity is also driven by the same purpose. He says, not only are we of the same mind, not only do we have the same love, not only are we in full accord or tuned to the same spirit, but we also are of one mind. It's that we're intent. We're thinking one thing and focused on one task. The same word, interestingly enough, of being of one mind is also used later on in what Ivan read earlier in, in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. It states this, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. You see, when we put our focus on ourselves, the result is that we want to get rid of others rather than working things out. But yet a gospel-centered life takes the individual ideas and plans to make them one as it follows Christ. The perfect picture of unity is found in Roman, uh, Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 through 12. Look at these words on the screen here. After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice. Notice, this is a chorus that's of all peoples, all nations, all languages, all gathered around the throne. And what are they saying? Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And not only were the people screaming it, there was a, a massive, massive choir that not only included those that were redeemed, it includes the angels there and the elders and the living creatures, all of them. And notice what happens at the end. They fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped the Lord. Oh, that's the picture of unity, is it not? In one unified voice saying salvation belongs to our God. May we, church, family, may we display this virtue through gospel-centered living as we go from this place and in this place as we magnify the Lord Jesus. But not only this, notice what else. We see a life that is also characterized by a disposition of humility. Another way to think about this is humbleness or thinking little of one's self. And as we think about humility, there's some truths that we find here in this passage that Paul tells us going back to verse 3. In verse 3, he says, Do nothing with selfish ambition. Do nothing with selfish ambition. You know, humility fights Self-seeking. And when you think about self-seeking, think about a self-seeking politician who pursues office by unfair means. He does anything he can, or she does anything she can, to get into the office because she's putting self before anything else, or he's putting self before anything else. It's the understanding of selfishness. And selfishness is a desire to put oneself forward. Well, as we think about fighting self-seeking, I want you to see Romans chapter 2, verses 7 and 8. The words will be up on the screen. Paul says, To those 
who by patience and well-doing seek for the glory and honor and immorality, uh, immortality, sorry, he will give eternal life. But notice verse 8. But for those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. You see, a gospel-centered life is a selfless life. A gospel-centered life finds true joy in this very order. Think about the word joy. Jesus, others, yourself. So as we want to display this virtue of humility... It's important for us to think about the fact that humility fights against self-seeking. It's not putting yourself first, it's putting others first. But secondly, I want you to see humility rejects empty pride. Notice as Paul speaks here, and he says, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. And the picture I want you to have is this. I want you to picture a movie extra. I'm not talking about the main actor. I'm talking about the person, you know, can you imagine a movie and you're in the movie and you're an extra and maybe just the back of your head is going off in the movie. That's all that they see. And you go, hey, did you see that? Did you see that? That was me. I had a significant role. Did you see that? Sounds absurd, doesn't it? But here, As we think about this word, conceit, it's vain glory. It's worthless attention. Paul told the Galatians, and by extension he's telling us in Galatians 5, 24 through 26, notice what it says. A very clear truth, he says, and those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited. There's the same word. Provoked, provoking one another and envying one another. What Paul told the Galatians is that when we put the focus on ourselves... We're feeding our fleshly desires and not living according to the Spirit. But let me just tell you, a gospel-centered life seeks to put the focus where it truly belongs, in Christ alone. So humility rejects empty pride, but we also see humility regards others with great value. Paul says, as he completes this verse, count others, but in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. To count is to have an opinion or hold a view So to have an opinion of others or to hold a view of others as more important than yourselves, to regard others with value. As you think about what it means to regard others with value, I want you to think of something like the Nobel Prize. You know, the Nobel Prize is awarded annually in six different disciplines, physics, chemistry, medicine, literature, economics, and many of us know the Nobel Peace Prize, right? It's awarded to an individual that a group notices has carried forth or has made innovative steps or has helped society in one of these six areas. And that's the picture that we need to have as we think about humility. Regarding others with great value. Looking at them, not on the basis of who they are, but on what 
God has done through Christ for them in purchasing them with the precious blood of Jesus. Well, the perfect picture of humility is what we find in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11, which states, Have this attitude among yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant and being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. That is the perfect picture of humility. Lastly, there's one more trait that Paul points out here and is found for us in, in verse 4. And that trait is this, a life that's distinguished by a look of compassion. A life distinguished by a look of compassion. Again, I remind you, compassion is that deep-seated emotion that we all have. And as we think about that deep-seated emotion, how it stirs us to look at people differently. If you notice what he says, Paul says, he says, let each of you look not to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. As you think about this looking and looking out, I want you to think about this word. Look is a, is a military term, really. It's the word of a scout looking out and surveying the land, scanning the horizon for issues that may be in existence. We as believers, as we demonstrate or display this virtue of a gospel-centered life, as we look out, compassion should compel us to spy out and ask God whose needs we should meet. As we look around and look in our church family, it's not for us to say, well, you know, that's a youth and they don't have any connection to me and I know they don't have a need so I don't need to be involved in that person's life. Or that person's from this place and I'm from this place and I, 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 I shouldn't be engaged or I, I don't know how to engage them. No, compassion should stir you to spy out in the land and go, there's a need there. What can I do to meet that need? The perfect picture that we have of this is what we find in Jesus in Matthew chapter 9, verse 36. It tells us that when Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. He was stirred. Why was he stirred? Well, the verse tells us because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Well, the perfect picture of that compassion is noticing the need and being moved to want to help that need. And what did Christ do for us? Well, as Philippians already pointed out, he emptied himself and took on the form of human likeness. God in flesh and came, as we sang earlier, from the cradle to the cross for you. So that you can be in right standing with God. As we come to the conclusion of these things, there's two questions at the bottom of the page that I would ask you today to consider. The first question is this, do you know the joy that God gives in Jesus? If not, I plead with you, thinking about the foundation of the joy that we have, I plead with you, trust in the grace of God 
through faith in Christ. To say it another way, look to Jesus. Look to Jesus. And there may be some of you here today that you have looked to Jesus. And you know that joy that God gives in Jesus. The second question I would ask you is this. Is your life gospel-centered? Is it showing the virtues of, humi- of unity, humility, and compassion? If not, I would plead with you, repent. Turn from your centered life to a gospel-centered life, recognizing what God has done in providing the gift of salvation through his son, Jesus. I would make the same plea to you that I made earlier to those who don't know the joy that God gives, and that is this. Look to Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. You know, I'm looking forward to Tuesday. I'm looking forward to, can you put the picture of the room back there? I'm looking forward to to going to that room and meeting with my brothers, your pastors, and talking about what God is doing in the midst of our congregation, the struggles that you are facing, to intercede, to join with you in prayer and praying for God to be gracious to you as you go through the trial that you're going through. But also to meet with my brothers and praise God for those of you that have the victories of life, that you are having the joys that you're being able to to experience at this moment and what God is doing to you, for you and praising God and praying to him and saying, thank you, God, for our church family. Church family, I've grown to know you better. And as I grow to know you better, I've grown to love you more. Thank you for the privilege of serving as one of your pastors. And I pray that you would complete my joy, as Paul states, by living out a gospel-centered life in unity, humility, and compassion. Let's go, Lord, in prayer.